Good afternoon and good morning to some of you. Uh, welcome to Hancock's webinar. Um, this webinar is special because we have our customer, Josh LaRose from the state of Vermont with us today. Josh, could you uh, quickly introduce yourself and say hello to everybody? Uh, hello everyone. Um, this is Josh uh, from the Vermont Weatherization Program and uh, some some of you I'm, I've been able to talk to in person in the past, uh, you know, as my uh, my peer Hancock software users. So um, looking forward to this and, and hopefully um, be able to provide some valuable insights about our our recent ability to get our five year approval from DOE um, to continue using the heat modeling software, some changes that we made to it um, that you may or may not want to pursue. Um, and uh, you could always reach out to me afterwards as well and, and happy to talk with you. Great. We also have Art Wilcox, who is Hancock's um, technical expert that assisted Josh through this process. Art, could you just say a quick hello to everyone? Sure. Hi, everyone. Is that quick enough? <laughs> Very quick. Um, Art and I frequently do these kind of webinars, so I'm Danielle. Um, I'm just going to introduce and then moderate the session. So uh, a pioneer in air infiltration energy modeling is what I think of Josh and his state. What happened was the state of Vermont noticed, as many of you noticed, maybe in the audit tool you use. So for everybody out there um, that uses the heat energy model, when they were modeling shell measures, it yielded low SIRs in general. Um, the energy model said it wasn't as cost effective as they would have expected. Uh, Josh and his state wanted to wanted to prove that installing insulation measures like wall and attic were more cost effective than energy models stated. So they set out to change the way DOE mandates air infiltration, air infiltration and shell energy modeling, and they succeeded. So today's webinar, you can listen how Josh approached this study alongside DOE and led his state to this change. And if you're interested, Josh would really like to encourage and help your state uh, in this process too. So I am gonna hand it over to you, Josh, if that's good with you. Yeah, sounds good. This is where I get nervous. Hopefully right. the transfer will work in, in the real time. Um, oh, and I'm supposed to say Josh um, has a sore throat. He's under the, wa the weather, so. Bear with him in his uh, volume. Maybe you have to turn your audio up. And if you have any questions, please use the question box. Uh, yeah, so I, I do have a very raspy voice that, uh, that's definitely fading on me. So I'm gonna do my best to, to project um, and hopefully people are able to hear me okay. Um, one second while I get this control out of my way. Um, so, before we dive into the specifics of energy modeling um, and, and maybe view quickly traditional approaches um, versus the adjusted approach, I really wanted to ground this in a broader context. Um, some of you at the state level may be very uh, acutely involved and very aware of DOE's weatherization program notice 19-4. Um, some of you at the sub-grantee level may not be quite as acutely involved, um, but maybe this will this will provide some valuable um, information to get a better sense of, of what your, your state partners um, and your federal partners are, are probably working on now or will be soon in the future. Um, so essentially, um, the weatherization program notice 19-4 updated the requirements that all grantees, um, commonly referred to as states, um, need to go through and prepare um, for each individual type of housing stock. Um, oftentimes we think about site-built homes differently than manufactured or mobile homes. And for each of those different types of homes, um, you need to go through an approval process and it's quite comprehensive. And when you come out the other side with your approval, those approvals are typically good for five years. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of a overview about our recent um, path through that submission to approval. So we're going to go through the submission itself 
and then some of our recommendations that you could take what you find uh, valuable and leave the rest, uh, but based on our road to gaining that five-year approval. So I guess when I when I first read WPN 19.4 and was looking at all of the different pieces that we had to pull together, um, I, I had mixed feelings. A, you know, I felt really good to know that our federal partners were expecting a lot from us and expecting high performance and great outcomes. Um, and at the same time, I was a little bit terrified about how much information we really had to pull together and uh, my head was spinning a bit. Um, so really what we had to had to do as a state um, was just make a plan and, and get organized. So I guess to try to simplify, what we really came up with was, was there were some critical must-reads. Um, there's WPN 19.4, there's a lot in there, but in reality, you take a deep breath, you read through it, it's only seven pages long. And then there are a number of supporting attachments um, that are enclosed and, and added onto that 19.4, which are 28 pages long. So those are definitely must-reads. Um, you gotta know what you're getting into. Um, and then there's the could-dos, um, which we definitely tried tried to take advantage of and, and reach out um, so that we weren't always reinventing the wheel when, when other people may have just recently had some some great successes that we could learn from. So we learned it, learned a lot from other states. Um, we um, collaborated with NASCAST a bit and with SMS, um, particularly this time around with Caleb Simon, who was a, a great resource and, and partner um, in helping us get through this process. So definitely recommend if you're if you're about to get into the throes of a, of a submission, that you reach out to others, as we found, uh, found that was very helpful. Oftentimes, uh, a federal term that we get thrown around a lot and, and hear a lot is a crosswalk. Um, and what we found was that that term and that exercise of crosswalking really came into play here as well, where on one side of the street, we had the DOE requirements as written. And then on the other side, we had our, our program operations and all of our policy materials that, that we've created over time. And maybe they have different titles and, and maybe they um, don't quite align with how DOE writes them up in their official materials. So we had to sort of uh, crosswalk back and forth between the two. And when we did that, um, we found that there were eight key submission requirements that DOE was looking for and, and anticipating. And when we did our crosswalk, we were really able to provide those eight things um, through five um, because we had some of our policies and procedures manual that sort of double, um, provide double duty for the way it's written in the 19.4 program guidance. So we drew up our plan and then we tried to execute it. And one of the first things that we tried to do was just develop a really comprehensive 19-4 submission checklist. And I, I think in the end, um, this ended up being like six pages long, just the checklist itself. Um, so there is a lot to this. Energy modeling is a part of it, but then it's really uh, a deep dive and review um, into all of your programmatic policies and procedures that interface with your energy modeling practices, which are so important because ultimately the results of your energy models um, drive the scopes of work that you're handing off to your installation teams um, and it, it shapes the service uh, services that you're providing to your clients. So it, um, there was a lot to it and we developed a checklist that we're happy to share with others. Um, if you wanted to reach out, we'll share anything that we have that could be of use to you. Um, some of the don'ts that I that I think um, we would recommend is um, don't cut and paste from the last time. Uh, DOE uh, through SMS um, are, are really going to be digging into this at a high level of detail, um, and it's not going to be to nitpick. It's really going to be to assure that in the end, uh, clients are, are getting great services. Um, so definitely make sure that you're not submitting dated materials that you're going through, you're, you're updating things. Um, you don't want to give them that, that spoiled fruit um, over there on the right. 
And one of the other things that, that we heard from reviewers informally um, and sort of off the record is, is a lot of photographic documentation is required as part of the submission process. And blurry pictures or black and white pictures really aren't helpful. Um, and you're just going to have to do it again anyway. So really make sure that when you're providing photographic documentation, um, it's crisp and it's clear and the reviewer is going to be able to see what exactly you're trying to convey in those photos. Uh, make sure that you're really mapping things out well through your crosswalk um, and, and explain how you're looking at every question asked in, in the WPN 19.4 requirements and making sure that you have an answer for every question is definitely going to save you a lot of time going back and forth um, and uh, expedite your review process. And finding ways to highlight the key information um, is really critical. So before we jump into like energy modeling, one of the key aspects of WPN 19.4 is really trying to promote national fidelity in the way we look at measure lifetimes. Um, I, I could only imagine how difficult it is to get multiple states on the same page. Um, I know we have a difficult time here in Vermont just trying to get five different local providers on the same page, so I could only imagine bringing that to a larger scale. Um, so WPN 19.4 had, had an intention to make sure that everybody was assigning the same measure lifetime assumptions to their library of measures. Um, and, you know, the notion that you can say the attic insulation is going to last 70 years, for example, is, is really gone by the wayside. Um, so we're really looking more at, at kind of that lifespan of a dog for a lot of measures, 10-year maximums. Um, or in, in some cases, 30-year maximum, which who knew, you type in Google search, what has a 30-year life expectancy zebra might pop up on your screen. So there we go. Maybe that'll, that'll help you remember that 30 years moving forward is definitely going to be um, a very common measure lifetime. And if you want to see a little bit more about what DOE's allowable measure lifetimes are, um, that's going to be found in WPN 19.4, Attachment 9. Table 9.2. And here are some of the highlights. Um, some of the things that, at least for our state, being in a, in a colder climate in the Northeast, um, really jumped off the page to us as some of our go to measures. So, really, what you're looking at is air sealing measures being set at 10 years along with duct sealing measures. Uh, 20 years, you're looking at sill box insulation, foundation insulation things that happen at the bottom of buildings and duct insulation. And then the 30 years are really very common to most, and there's definitely an asterisk there. It is most, but it's not all, types of attic, floor, and wall insulations. Um, you certainly do, as an individual state, have an opportunity to appeal those standard defaults and try to get longer lifetimes, um, but you do need to be able to back that up, and there's going to be an expectation that the the backup documentation that you provide comes from independent third parties, not from the manufacturer or the sales rep that's trying to push the product. Um, so that, that third party um, verification is going to be key if you have an intention to extend these lifetimes beyond the standard allowable set uh, outlined in Table 9.2 of Attachment 9. Um, I'm going to try to jump over um, outside the PowerPoint environment at some point to show what our final uh, approved measure lifetimes were for, for all of our measures, um, but I'll try to circle back to that in a minute. Another thing that you can do within um, the context of your WPN 19.4 submission or as a, a standalone request. Uh, but you will need to do it at some point if you haven't done so already, is you will need to fill out special materials requests to obtain formal DOE permission to install certain measures that are not officially listed in Appendix A. Um, I've got images of, of some of the frequent ones that other states uh, have had to submit for along with our own. Um, so if you want to use DOE funding to 
provide refrigerator replacements or rebulb homes with CFLs and or LEDs, you're going to have to go ahead and get a special permission from DOE to do that. And and I can attest as the person who did this for our state, working with Caleb, who was great to work with, that this is a very easy thing to get, but you do have to go through the, the appropriate forms and channels. So before we shift gears, I'm going to attempt to um, jump back to that Excel file that I had referenced. So bear with me for a second. So this is the format that we utilize um, to provide our complete library of measures from within the Hancock database um, for DOE slash SMS review. And this was the final set of measures um, along with the lifetime for every measure that's classified as an energy saving measure um, that came back as approved. Um, so we were able to, to get a kind of a raw data dump via script, um, thanks to Kirk and our at Hancock and then just ran a quick pivot table to try to separate them them out um, so that we could look at attic and roof measures on one tab, floor and foundation measures on another, and sort of break up the building, um, building shell section by section, um, along with some other um, mechanical types of measures. So one thing that I would like to point out, because it, it, I think is valuable information for other programs, um, is column H, is our official measure lifetimes that were approved in the end. Um, so as you'll see here, you see a lot of 30s and 20s, um, and, and that's pretty common for our insulation measures. Um, one thing that we did request approval for, but we didn't get, and, and that's fine, uh, but just to be transparent about it, is we did put in a request to increase the anticipated measure lifetime of spray foam insulation materials from the standard default of 20 years, um, but we didn't get approval for that. So all of the spray foam measures in Hancock for us are now programmed at 20 years, as opposed to other things like cellulose and fiberglass and rigid foam board materials, all, all of which came back with 30-year 30, 30 approvals. So this is sort of the essential um, information that we were able to pare this down to in order to get approval for our, our library of measures. We had to showcase what the R value was for things that are classified as energy saving, um, and we had to let them know what measure group they were a part of when you're looking at these in the, the Hancock interface and what our proposed measure lifetime was. And I'm happy to share this file with anybody afterwards who would care to see it. So shifting gears uh, more to maybe the reason why a lot of you, particularly at, at local providers, may have logged into this call today, we're going to look at the energy modeling software. So part two of this presentation agenda is to review the infiltration reductions accomplished in reality across a number of past weatherization projects. Explore the infiltration reductions attributed to specific energy conservation measures performed on recent WAP jobs in our state. And look at the energy modeling adjustments for building shell measures that insulate and air seal through one, one distinct action. When you're not doing a two-step process, you're doing one measure um, that results in an insulation benefit and an air sealing reduction benefit. So the way we really approached this was um, as we were going through our um, submission process, um, we wanted to work in partnership with Hancock and SMS um, and utilize this as a time to act on an energy modeling improvement opportunity 
related to insulation measures that are installed in one step, but provide two meaningful energy saving benefits. So what we were finding, um, and this is not unique to Hancock, um, this, is, this is the traditional energy modeling approach for most um, energy modeling software programs, um, particularly if you're looking at energy modeling in the context of single family homes. Um, they really view insulating and air sealing as two very separate things, um, and it's quite siloed. So that was the traditional approach. And this is where we wanted to go. We really wanted to look at that as sort of a mixed fruit where air sealing and insulation happen when you perform just one task. And this is kind of how we got there. So one thing I, I don't want to be presumptuous, whether our state's doing something that you would consider good or bad, I have no idea. Um, so I'm sort of curious, and I don't know if we can pull this off in a webinar environment, but I'm curious to know what people on the call would think um, and what you would offer up in response to this question. So think about the, the typical weatherization projects that you were involved with and ask yourself, by what percent would you need to see the blower door readings reduced? And this isn't just looking at one project, but if you were to go evaluate 10 projects, what would you need to see for an average blower door reduction percentage to think that exemplary work was being performed? Is it 10%, is it 20%, is it 30%? Um, I don't know, Danielle, is there a way to, to sort of get an idea of what people would think was, was really exemplary work? There is. Let me um, launch the poll. You talk a little bit in the background and it's almost launched. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> we have. All right, I think it's saved. Let's see if this works. Okay, I'm going to launch the poll and everybody can record. Nope, that's the wrong poll. Ten, twenty, or thirty, right? Ten, twenty, or yeah, thirty plus, I guess. All right, got it. Do you see it? Or do I have to share? Yeah, you see it, right? Yeah, everybody sees it. So, okay. Josh, people, do you want to restate People are the voting. Question? Yeah. Do um, you want so to say the question? I'm just curious what percent would you expect to see on, on an average blower door reduction across 10 projects to think that exemplary work was being performed? Um, different states and different climates, you know, focus focus on different things. So I don't want to be presumptuous about what's good, what's bad. Uh, okay, so about 75% of the attendees voted. So let's close the poll and share the results. Do you see the results, Josh? Yep, okay, yep. So. So it looks like uh, sort of 20%, about 42% of, of people who had voted said they would think really good work was being done during the weatherization project if they saw a 20% reduction on average for the blower door numbers. And about 56% said um, they think 30% or greater blower door reduction percentages would, would be exemplary. Um, so that's just good to kind of ground, ground any of our potential data. And again, Different climates, people focus on different things. We're in the Northeast and we really hammer on the building shelf um, because that's really where the most cost effective investment comes from. Um, so let me keep rolling with the PowerPoint. Um, so what what we found when we looked back with Hancock's help um, across a, a large body of, of work um, was that our average blower door reductions on our single family projects were hovering right around 40%. Um, in CFM 50 terms, the way a lot of people think about this stuff, we were getting just under 1,700 CFM 50 reductions um, 
on average. And this sampling came from 899 single family projects. And those single family projects included site built and mobile homes. Um, no multi-dwelling unit projects were included in that data. So anything two units or larger is, is not represented here. This is really just looking at true single family homes. And this actually, I just pulled really quickly before I got on the call today from a presentation that was a couple of years ago. Um, we've, we've looked at this since and it's really been quite consistent over the course of the last three years. Um, depending on whether we look at this information through a one-year lens, a two-year lens, or a three-year lens, we really only move um, about two percentage points, um, depending on how we look at it. It's always 40, 41, or 42 percent. So it seems like it's been pretty consistent, at least for the last three-year period of time. And these are all based on real blower door uh, results, not estimates. And that that sort of led us to questions about, okay, we're, we're reducing the blower door number, the buildings are less drafty when we're done. Where, where are those reductions really coming from? Um, so I guess I'll pose another question. Um, I'm gonna pull up a, a slide and I'd like you to think about which type of energy improvements are being accomplished in the pictures that are shown. So I'll leave this one up for a minute, and I think Danielle will be able to pull this. And tell me your choices once more, Josh, I'll make sure I got it right. Yep, so in the Forward. pictures that we're looking at, it's uh, whether people think that they're looking at something that's an air sealing measure, an insulating measure, or one measure that does both things, that it has an air sealing benefit and an insulation benefit. So this is the, the first set of pictures. Okay, are you ready for me to um, show that poll? Yep, go ahead and launch the poll. Your picture disappears when we do that, but. So far the audience is smart, 40% air infiltration reduction. Okay, we have about 70% that voted, so I'm gonna close the poll. Okay. Okay, so it looks like uh, people were pretty split um, about whether this was just an air sealing measure or whether it was an air sealing and insulating measure. Um, and I guess in the, in the context of what we ended up getting approval for, the measures shown here will still be treated as an air sealing only measure. So we're really looking at somebody putting on like a door sweep on the bottom of a door, um, somebody using some caulking materials to keep drafts out. Um, in the bottom left corner, we're looking at somebody using one part spray foam uh, to seal up uh, some potential leakage that's, that's coming in around a window rough opening. Um, and then this top left corner is up in an attic after pulling the insulation back, um, sealing up at the top of an exterior wall uh, before blowing additional insulation over it. So um, these, we have, and even after the changes to the energy modeling software, would continue to consider air sealing only measure. Um, and we can look at another slide. And if we could kind of reissue the same poll, if that's possible, for these measures here. Yes, would you like me to launch the poll now? Yeah, yes, and hopefully people have had a chance to look at both pictures. And again, it's kind of the same thing. Is, is what you're looking at, somebody's done some air sealing, somebody's done some insulating, or somebody's done both? Okay, we've had about 70% of the audience votes, so I'm going to close the poll. 
Okay, so, and, and this one, it looks like about 24% of people said it was air sealing that they're looking at, um, 6% said insulating, and the majority, 69%, said it looked like one thing was being done, um, but they were getting an air sealing and insulating benefit. And within the context of um, how we in Vermont thought about these measures that we're showing you, and in the context of our approval to change the way the energy modeling software works, um, when we're looking at the savings to investment ratios for individual measures, these pictures both represent something that does both. Um, so the picture on the left is of somebody going in and spray foaming a box fill area around the perimeter of a basement. And in our program, they're probably putting that in three or four inches thick. So it's sealing out drafts and it's providing our value. Um, so moving forward, the software looks at that as a measure that is doing two things. Um, on the right, for people in different parts of the country, this, this may be a familiar product um, or this might be completely foreign to you. Essentially what you're looking at here, this door is something that was built on site. So you're looking at the interior layer. It's like a thin sheet of Luan or something. Um, and then there's a sheet of foam board. And then the outside is a layer of plywood. Um, and depending on how exposed that is to the element, um, that might just be regular plywood or it might be pressure treated plywood. So those get built on site. And in Vermont, we call those sandwich doors where we're trying to reduce drafts um, at that point so that, that lead out of our basements um, and usually to a set of stairs. Um, so, you know, we're getting the insulation value and we're reducing drafts. And then this is the, the last set of pictures where if, if you'll humor me, Danielle, and run that poll again, same poll for these two pictures. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. All right, so this one was a, a little more split again, kind of similar to the first of three slides. Um, it looked like 2% of you said that that was air sealing work, in your opinion. 44% said it was insulating work, and 53% said both. Um, so in the, in the context of how we are going to be using the Hancock Energy software moving forward, the measures shown here um, would be considered measures that accomplish both things, um, air sealing reductions and insulation improvements. Um, so on the left-hand side, that's pictures of people um, dense packing an exterior wall with cellulose insulation. Um, the right-hand side, that's a picture of somebody within a knee wall closet. Um, there were very small triangle exterior walls on each end of that knee wall closet that they spray foamed with like three inch thick spray foam. And then they put house wrap and strapping. Um, and then once that was hung up, they poked holes through it and they dense packed the underside of that roof with cellulose insulation. So uh, moving forward, we're able to, to enter that once into the Hancock software, but the software is able to look at that as something that's providing both benefits. Um, so again, this is based on that same number of jobs, 899 single family projects where we were getting those 40% blower door reductions. What we were looking at in Hancock was the actual job cost for the materials and the on-site labor to achieve those 40% reductions. Um, the average cost of those jobs was $6,660 and some change. And the actual project level SIRs that we were getting was 4.1. But what we found was that 
the actual air sealing costs were only coming up at about one thousand dollars and the actual air sealing measure group SIRs were coming up at 13.1. And, and our feeling was that those air sealing measure costs were understated um, and the SIRs were overstated. Um, and then on the flip side, we felt like we were continuing to find that our insulation measures um, had overstated costs and understated our values. Um, because of that traditional approach to energy modeling where air sealing and insulating are viewed as two separate silos. Um, so that, that again, is really what we were trying to tackle. And SMS, you know, was great to work with. Uh, we started to talk about potentially adjusting the way the software worked with, with Glenn Salas a couple of years ago. Um, and they were always... Glenn and, and Caleb and folks we talked to at DOE were always very, um, very appreciative of, of what we had to, to say and our feedback about modeling engines. And they were supportive of the concept that we were trying to move forward with. But they said, you know, prove it. You, you know, if you if you think the uh, the air sealing is coming from these insulation measures, we really need real data from real projects. We, we can't just take your word for it, um, which is, you know, understandable. So what we did is we did an informal air sealing impact evaluation where we asked one of our providers to intentionally, I hate to use the word slow down, um, but we asked them to stop doing multiple shell measures at the same time, maybe send some smaller crews to the job and extend the project out longer than typical so that they could do one thing at a time, take a blower door reading before they did the task and then take a blower door reading after they did the task. So we could really look at what was the blower door reduction attributable to this one measure. And what we found in doing this informal impact evaluation uh, was that exterior walls contributed an average CFM 50 reduction of 458. Uh, just insulating the transitional space between the ceiling on the first floor and the floor on the second floor, kind of wrapping around the perimeter of the building and looking at that rim joist area. We found that when we dense pack that area with cellulose insulation, um, or um, if we had access to it or could make access to it through a knee wall closet and spray foam the area, um, that we were getting 248 CFM 50 reduction just from treating that transitional space between floors of the building um, around the perimeter. Uh, when we were dense packing closed cavity slanted ceilings with cellulose insulation, we were getting 420 CFM 50 reductions on average. Uh, when we were looking at insulating floors, and this is a blend of site built and mobile homes, so it includes mobile home bellies. Uh, but just by insulating those areas, we were getting on average 253 CFM50 reduction. When we were insulating mobile home roofs, we were getting an average of 223 CFM50 reduction. And when we were spray foaming the box sill around the perimeter of a basement or crawl space area, we were getting 296 CFM50 reduction on average. Um, if you look at that another way and just want to look at what was the percent of the total project infiltration reduction that was attributable just to that one specific measure, um, that's also displayed here in chart number two. Um, so what we found, which, um, you know, anecdotally, our intuition told us it was very impactful, um, but what this sort of proved to us was that insulating mobile home roofs without really taking any intentional time to do fine tuning type of air sealing just adding more insulation into the mobile home roof cavity um, we were getting major reduction 30 percent of the reductions that we were achieving on our mobile homes were coming just from insulating the roofs um, and and that really popped out at us and you know this this wasn't a legit study and we're not trying to pretend that it was it, it was really an evaluation and we are going to continue to do this over time on more of our projects, but this gives you an idea of how many times we took those measurements um, to produce those averages that were shown. 
Um, so it was definitely the least disruptive to um, our agency's operations um, and ability to get all of their contract obligations met to foam the box still in the basement. And we have a higher sampling rate there. It was very easy to just say, okay, we're going to take a lower door reading before and after we foam the box sill. So we have 25 projects in that average, whereas the rim between the first and second floor, um, we only have eight projects included in that average because that's a pretty time and intensive measure to do. And I'm going to skip over these, but I'm happy to, to share this with other people that want to dig into it further. Um, but some interesting data. Um, and I want to land here for a second. So what we were looking at here was, okay, if we were to hone in on the average square footage of the insulation measure that was completed, what are we looking at? So for the exterior walls that were included in this evaluation, it's not like we were doing thousands and thousands of square feet. The average amount of wall area that we were um, performing improvements on was just under 600 square feet to get the results that we had shown on the earlier slide. Um, the mobile home roof on, on one of the slides that we had shown earlier showed that we were getting 30% of our overall blower door reduction just from insulating that mobile home roof, but we're looking at a, a fairly large surface area by comparison to some of these other spots. Uh, on average, the roof uh, or ceiling cavity was 942 square feet. When we, when we look at those transitional construction details between stories of the building, either you know between the basement and the first floor or between the first floor and the second floor, uh, we were finding that even though those were very small surface areas, they had a really large impact um, on a square foot uh, basis to our overall blower door reduction. So even though for the rim joist between the first and second floor, we were only really treating 105 square feet of surface area, per 100 square feet, we were getting 237 CFM50 reductions, which is pretty notable for such a small area. And for the box sill around the, the basement perimeter and crawl spaces as well, we were treating an average of 138 square feet, um, but on a per 100 square foot basis, we were getting 215 CFM 50 reductions on average. So um, this this was some of the information that we were able to gather um, to promote the concept that we were trying to push that we would like our energy modeling engine to better analyze measures where we take one action, but we're really accomplishing two very tangible benefits. And I'm going to skip over this. Um, this is a, a look at sort of the screen changes, but I'm going to present it in a different context. Um, just one second, please. So I want to jump back to the actual air sealing evaluation that we did out in the field uh, because DOE uh, and SMS have indicated that any other state that would like to sort of follow in the footsteps that we've taken to, to adjust the, the energy modeling engine for their programs would have to provide their own data. Um, you wouldn't be able to just say, well, this was the data from Vermont. So we would like our approval too. You would have to be able to provide similar data. Um, I'm happy to share, uh, we're happy to share as a state anything that could be of use to you if you would like to pursue that. Um, starting just with data collection forms. Uh, this is one example of the forms that we use to collect the data um, for site built homes. So we were really just trying to figure out some very basic information, what type of building it was, how many above grade stories there were, what the construction type and details were, what the starting and ending project blower door levels were, and some information about the individual surface of the building shell that we were treating. Um, 
so that we could do some analysis. So this was what the, the field staff were using um, for some of these measures out in the field for a site built home. And then we've got similar data collection forms for the mobile home as well. And all of that fed into this spreadsheet that is a bit unruly and kind of crude, but it got the job done. And I'm happy to share this template with anyone that wants it. Um, essentially what we made was just a real quick um, down and dirty spreadsheet where we could enter the stuff from the data collection sheets and analyze the data in a somewhat automated fashion. Um, so as we scroll across this seemingly never ending spreadsheet, we have the different categories. We have exterior wall information. We have rim joist information. We have the closed cavity slope ceilings, et cetera. When you scroll all the way over to the right, There's some additional project level data. And we've built out these other tabs that sync with these um, to make it a little bit easier to get at that summary data in table form. So we have different tables on different group, uh, different tabs. And then ultimately what we were presenting um, as part of our submission packet to um, DOE and SMS um, was charted data. So these charts automatically update as you enter additional projects over time, which is pretty handy because then you can just export the charts um, as you need. Um, so every time you enter a new project here, you automatically get updated information in your charts. So part of the WPN 19.4 submission requirements is that you as a state provide your user guides um, or your guidance documentation for how you expect your providers to use the Hancock Energy software. Um, Hancock has some, some nice resources that sort of give a generalized view of the capabilities of the software. Um, but the expectation is that you would have your own um, sets of use, user guides customized to how you expect your program operators to utilize the software. Um, so what we did was we, we updated um, our existing guidance and we submitted that. So this is just an example of, of what we have for guidance. So this is our guidance for how to enter a site built home in Hancock. And it sort of goes screen by screen, field by field. And it notes what the software is able to do or the fields that are available in the software, but it also notes what Vermont's individual programmatic expectations are. Um, which fields are required that may not be marked with a red asterisk um, by the software, um, and if there are any additional criteria that need to be followed about certain fields, um, those are all outlined here. And this is a 23-page document, but it's not all words. It's a lot of pictures. Um, and I could share that with anybody who's who's interested, um, who is uh, also using Hancock and who needs to go through a 19-4 approval process. If this helps you in any way, uh, avoid reinventing the wheel. Be because we were changing the air sealing screen, we extracted that section out of this larger user guide and we created a standalone user guide just dealing with the new changes. I'm going to pull that one up next. Josh, we do have two questions if you would like to answer those. Yeah, any, the first one is anytime. Were there any indoor air quality concerns with the air ceiling? I think there, there are always indoor air quality concerns, and it's always a balancing act in trying to 
provide good energy savings uh, realities for the clients while promoting um, better indoor air quality, um, meeting the ASHRAE 622 2016 standards and, and mechanical ventilation expectations, and at the same time ensuring that none of the combustion appliances are backdrafting into the home. So I, I would say yes, always. Um, there, there are always indoor air quality concerns, and um, we, we try to do our best to look at the house and all of the appliances inside of the system um, and ensure that Yes, we're saving energy, um, but more importantly, uh, we're creating a good, healthy, uh, safe indoor environment for the family, um, and we're and we're doing no harm. So I, I don't know how to how to answer that um, without uh, without really getting into the weeds. Um, but it was it was top of mind, um, and, and it always is. The next question, um, in regards to your agencies, what kind of training did you need to do after the energy modeling was changed? Uh, so um, as we were doing this study, um, we were keeping people um, aware of, of how things were, were progressing, what our intentions were. Um, we were really transparent with our um, technical excellence committee. Um, we have a technical excellence committee, which many programs do. Um, in our state, we have at least two representatives from every single one of our local providers, as well as some of us here at the state. Um, and and we, would, we would go over this stuff pretty regularly. Um, we have also had um, two webinars now um, for anybody that wants to learn more about the expectations of our software. Um, all of this guidance was issued to our statewide contact list, and we've had informal follow-up, sort of one-on-one, one-on-two, one-on-three um, types of small interactions with, with people out in the field who, who have wanted some, some time with us. So I guess it's, it's been kind of a combination of things to make sure that we've been really consistent in our messaging so, so that the actual execution and application of these new features um, aligns well with our original intention and the commitments that we made to DOE um, uh, that we would be using this responsibly and not just as a cheat to make the SIRs say whatever we wanted. Um, and, and we anticipate that um, the training and technical assistance will be ongoing. Um, I guess shifting gears a little bit, part of the WPN 19.4 submission expectations is that you submit your curriculum um, that you use to train your own network on how to use the software correctly um, from data entry all the way through the results of the energy modeling engine. So um, luckily we already had that stuff really well developed and we were able to just share our training curriculum for Hancock that we use. Um, and uh, we only had to make some minor adjustments to that curriculum to incorporate these new features. Okay, there is another question. <laughs> Uh, were you required to cover the raw spray foam in joist pockets with a rigid barrier once cured? If so, did this change the installed cost for the installation? How did that change the modeled SIRs for that measure? Ah, that's a great question. Um, so, so in Vermont, um, our policies in our state are that if you are only treating the box fill, that you do not have to fire coat it. But as soon as you start to insulate the foundation wall, then all of the foam um, has to, at least at minimum, have an intumescent barrier over it um, that provides a 15 minute fire retardant value. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Okay, so this is this is our user guide um, that's been updated 
now that the software has been updated about how to use the infiltration screen um, because uh, for the end user, the person who's performing the data entry, that's really where the lion's share of the changes happened um, on the user interface. So when you're recording your blower door testing information, you would navigate to the air infiltration screen, and this is where you would start to enter your various blower door tests. So that is a little bit different than it used to be because the target number, which is really just your guess of where you think the blower door will end up uh, after your crews or subcontractors are done with their work. That used to be a data field up here where you would type in a number. Um, and now that target is listed here along with actual pre-intermittent uh, or post blower door entries. Um, so even, even that gas um, is entered by clicking this plus button and providing the value on the subsequent screen that pops up. So that's a, a small difference um, that I'm not quite sure if all users have yet. And then this just gives an example of the, the individual rows as you're entering information in. And then we get into, okay, we're, we're doing insulating work on the building shell. What are those building shell insulation measures impact on the overall air infiltration reduction? So this is what is new for Vermont users when they perform their data entry in Hancock. On the air sealing screen, down toward the bottom, there's this new section with the title Shell Measures Impact on Air Infiltration. And we've encouraged people to get into the new habit of always entering their full audit first, navigating through all of the weatherization screens, adding all of their measures for the, the project that they're, they're going to, and then circling back to the infiltration screen last. Um, that's certainly not a rigid requirement by any means. It's just something that we've encouraged as a, as a logical sequencing of the data entry. Because once you've entered all of the information on the other screens and created measures on the other screens, they will automatically show up here in this new grid at the bottom of the air infiltration screen. So you'll get your measure title. You'll get the section that it's associated with. And this section is whatever the user typed in that will be meaningful to the installation team. If they don't type anything in, then it'll just default to something like Attic 1, Attic 2. Um, so this is a combination of just the defaults, because people opted not to type anything in, and text that the user typed in themselves, top wall or bulkhead door or sills. When you first go to this screen, this column that says air sealing impact will automatically default to none. And if you leave it at the default, it's essentially like the software never changed. These measures here are insulation measures, and the cost that you enter for these measures will all go into the savings to investment ratio that gets displayed for that individual measure on the energy savings screen. But if you change this, then you will, you will see some adjustments over here. And let me scroll to a different image. So this shows the same set of measures after the user changed a couple of these uh, choices to say that, well, for this measure, we're, we're doing a pull down staircase. We're enclosing that with a site built assembly that's going to have really high R value and it's going to provide a very airtight seal. So they said for this measure, the air sealing impact is going to be major. For the measure below that one, they said we're going to dense pack an exterior wall with cellulose. And they said that the air sealing impact for that measure is going to be significant. The sill here at the bottom, they said we're going to insulate that box sill area with three inch thick application of spray foam. And the air sealing impact for that, based on what we observed in that home, is going to be significant. So these choices, there's only four. There's none, there's minor, 
there's significant and there's major. Each of those choices is automatically linked to a cost share feature where it will look at what was the total cost to perform this one measure and it will automatically subtract a fixed percentage of that cost and redirect it toward the total cost of the air sealing work so that that subset of the cost will impact the SIR that will display for the overall building's infiltration reduction, which leaves an adjusted cost here in this column. And that remaining cost, called adjusted cost, is the amount of funding that will go into the SIR calculation for that building shell insulation measure. So in this case, for that pull down staircase, where they pick the air sealing impact will be major. It's really it's sort of an air sealing measure, it's sort of an insulating measure. It has pretty equal, <laughs> equal proportions in, in the benefit. It's a 50-50 split. So $113.36, that's 50% of the total measure cost. That's gonna be screened against the R value improvement. And the other half of the cost is gonna be redirected into the total that goes into the air sealing SIR. And this is a table that shows the, the cost share that's programmed in based on the choice that you make in the drop down list for the air ceiling impact selection. So with none, it works just like before. 100% of the measure cost goes against the R value improvement. If you pick minor, 90% of the cost goes against the R value improvement and impacts that SIR and the remaining 10% balance would get redirected toward the air sealing SIR. For significant, it's a 70-30 split. And for major, again, we just talked about that, it's 50-50. The, the next thing that we had to do is, is develop some uh, acceptable procedures for when these choices are allowable. Because we couldn't just say, okay, everybody, we want to get higher SIRs, accurate or not, always pick major. That's definitely not what we were going for. We really wanted this to be um, the most accurate and best guess after somebody had actually gone through the building, done a lot of diagnostic testing, and based on their experience, um, made their best possible guess. And we wanted to establish some parameters for allowable guesses. So we, we made a table for mobile homes about what's allowable for choices by measure description and what's not allowable. And we made the same type of table for site-built homes. So these top few choices are the only choices where you're allowed to choose major, where you get that 50-50 split. We're talking about attic hatch assemblies, that are eight square foot or larger, where you are modeling them separately as a separate surface. We're talking about sandwich doors, which may be a weird term that nobody outside of Vermont ever uses, but again, we showed a picture of that earlier. Um, that's where we're, we go on site. We essentially have two layers of plywood on each side of a sheet of uh, foam board. Or if we're air sealing and insulating those transitional spaces between stories of the building, between the basement and the first floor, or between the first floor and the second floor. And then we're allowed to choose major if based on the on-site um, evaluation and diagnostic testing that seems appropriate. So this just sort of goes category by category. What are the allowable choices? What are the non-allowable choices? And one important thing where the allowable choice is always none, and we're never allowed to choose minor, significant, or major, is if we're gonna insulate a flat attic area with any insulation material, and we're installing that in a non-enclosed cavity. So if we're going up in an attic where there's a lot of room, where you can stand up, perhaps, um, and you're, you're going to be air sealing as one step, and then adding the insulation as step two, um, that's not viewed as a one-step process, so we can never claim um, any air sealing impact from blowing in that loose fill insulation product.
And then what you'll see in the end, which is a really nice feature, I think Lily thought of this one, uh, or at least Lily gets to take credit for it. Um, oftentimes, when somebody is maybe playing around with these choices, they want to know what is the impact of the choice that I just made on this measure saving to investment ratio. Before, you would always have to go to the energy savings page, the energy savings screen in Hancock, in order to get a look at those SIRs. But now there's a calculate SIR button directly on the air ceiling screen that sort of acts like a hyperlink to the energy savings page. So you don't have to continue to go back and forth. If you've entered enough information on all of the other screens in the software, where you would have traditionally been able to successfully generate an energy savings report, then when you click this calculate SIR button, you'll be able to see the SIRs without leaving the screen, which is a really nice thing. And, and that's sort of it in a nutshell, um, covered by this six pager. Um, it sort of shows what the screens look like, um, what the, the different mechanics are that are built in behind the scenes, and it also acts as a, a program guidance document that clearly outlines what's allowable and what's not allowable, um, depending on the type of measure that you're adjusting. And that is really all I've got prepared at this point. So I guess I'll, I'll turn it back over to, to Danielle. Thank you, Josh. Um, do we have any more questions? I didn't see any more come in yet. Yes, I did. Okay. Ready? Is there or will there be any energy bill analysis on the houses? Could, could you repeat the question, Danielle? Is there or will there be any energy bill analysis on your sample houses? Energy bill analysis is a tricky thing in Vermont because we're such a rural state. And a majority of households use bulk fuels, and it's really difficult to do high quality fuel studies. We, we do them periodically, um, but we don't have the luxury of just reading the natural gas meter from month to month, except for a very tiny um, part of the state up in, up in uh, the Lake Champlain area. So uh, I would say that this won't have any bearing whatsoever on the frequency that we actually do fuel studies. Um, the things that we do plan to pay very close attention to are um, what are our overall infiltration reductions across our projects and continue to do our air sealing evaluation where we're, we're doing a blower door before and after individual tasks so that we can at least know with confidence that we're using this feature in a way that depicts reality in terms of what are the infiltration reductions? How, how that translates to actual recognized savings um, is a bit more of a leap that's, that's hard to do without uh, having natural gas meters to read, unfortunately. Great, well, Josh, thank you so much for uh, the comprehensiveness of your presentation. It sounds like you have a lot of materials that you're willing to share, so I can work with you to have a central way to share that to everybody interested. But thank you so much for giving this presentation today. And thank you everybody for attending. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I'll send out the recording to everybody that either signed up or attended. All right, thank you everybody. Have a good afternoon. You too.